Hi and welcome back to Scotty's Tech.info. I'm Scotty with my co-host Cletus. And lately in the news, uh, Mozilla came out and they said, hey, we're going to be releasing this new version of our Firefox web browser. Uh, it's going to be version number 72, I believe. And they're going to release it on, I think, January 7th of 2020. So in just about a month from now. And uh, the big new feature in Firefox 72 is apparently browser fingerprint protection. Okay, so what exactly is a browser fingerprint and why do you need to be protected from it? Well, basically a browser fingerprint is a fingerprint of your browser. It's essentially a unique ID that is generated um, and it can be used to uniquely identify your particular browser slash computer slash you uh, among all the other internet users. So, Okay, what exactly is it and how does it work? Well, as we all know, the internet, i.e. web pages, consist of HTML and CSS. HTML is basically the, the format of the page, the structure. You have a center column, you have a left column, a right column, uh, you have paragraphs here, that sort of thing, you have text. That's HTML. CSS is uh, style, basically. Uh, the color of fonts, the you know italics, bold, uh, the position of boxes of text or images on the page, you know, you know, shuff, shuffle this guy to the left or the right, or you know, that kind of thing. The overall style of the page. And finally, the third component of modern web pages is JavaScript. Now, JavaScript is uh, a nowadays a very powerful uh, web programming language. JavaScript is what makes, say, Google Docs actually work. JavaScript is what powers 100%. Uh, Facebook, for example, when you click, you know, a menu button or something, and the menu pops up, and and you can click stuff, and basically anytime anything happens on the web, any of the web, the so-called web 2.0 fanciness, the interactivity uh, that we all know and love on the internet today, all of that is more or less powered by JavaScript. Now, because JavaScript is so powerful, it needs access to certain bits of information. For example, JavaScript can know uh, the resolution of your screen, the width and the height in number of pixels. It can also know the orientation of your screen. So, for example, if you're using a smartphone uh, on my website, scottystech.info, I can put a little bit of JavaScript on there, and the code runs in the background, and you don't even know it's there. And what it's doing is it's detecting the resolution of your screen and also the orientation. So if you have a smartphone, it would know you have a smartphone, and it would know if you're holding it in landscape mode or portrait mode. So using JavaScript, I can find out all kinds of interesting bits of information, such as I can know what web browser you're using. I can know what operating system you're using. I can find out the device type. Is it a laptop, a desktop, a smartphone, a tablet? Uh, sometimes I can even find out the actual make and model of the gizmo you're using to surf the internet. I can also discover with uh, just a little bit of simple JavaScript code, as I said, your screen resolution and the orientation, the default language, the time zone you're in, uh, what browser plugins you have installed. For example, if you have uh, an Acrobat installed, you know, the PDF reader, and it has a little add-on for the browser, or uh, if you have VLC Media Player, there's a VLC uh, Media Player plugin uh, for, for various browsers. Is that there or not? I can actually find that out with JavaScript which means all you have to do is surf to my website and that JavaScript code runs in the background and it can grab all this information uh, about your computer and you don't even know it's there, you don't even know it's running. Other information you can get about a person, person's computer using JavaScript are if they have Microsoft Office installed or not and even which specific Office apps they have installed. Um, also, I can find out are you actively using the browser uh, that's a little bit different than, say, is the window minimized or maximized, uh, but you can discover if the person is actively, you know, the mouse cursor is moving around in the browser tab, uh, or if it's more likely to be sort of in the background. Now, that's kind of the piddly stuff, but there's more hardcore stuff. Um, there's uh, something called a font test, where uh, basically what they do is you run a little bit of JavaScript code, and it... Uh, <laughs> It more or less takes, a, it, it draws a box. You don't actually see the box on the screen. It's using JavaScript to sort of draw a box off the viewport, off of 
outside of the viewable area of the web page that you're looking at, so you don't even know it's there. It draws this box, and then in a particular font, it writes a word or a series of letters, like, say, the letter A. And then after it draws that hidden box, puts the letter A or, you know, a few letters, then it actually looks at what the browser has just drawn. JavaScript code is doing this, and it sees it can see the sort of variations. It, it sort of uses the way that it renders text um, uh, to get certain information, because if you perform this font rendering test on different computers and different gizmos, each computer renders text slightly differently. It's, uh, you know, every, every gizmo has like a different processor, a different graphics card, even different drivers for the graphics cards. All these little details, they all add up so that the way that my computer draws a letter A on the screen is not the same as the way that your computer draws a letter A on the screen. So you can do this, this uh, so-called font test uh, to actually get some sort of uniquely identifying information about exactly how that person's computer draws the letter A. Similarly, there are a couple other tests. Um, one is WebGL. WebGL is basically a JavaScript API where uh, using JavaScript, I can uh, draw fancy 2D and 3D graphics in a web page. Uh, it uses your graphics processor, so it's very powerful for doing fancy graphics on web pages. And again, it's similar to the font test, the way that your computer draws fancy 2D and 3D graphics in an off-screen hidden box. That can also be used to uniquely identify your particular computer. And lastly, the third hardcore uh, nifty thing that JavaScript can do is the canvas test. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail about this one either, but again, a canvas element is an HTML element, and it's it's essentially the same thing. You kind of draw a box off the screen, and how it, how the browser is actually drawing stuff in this canvas element can you be used to uniquely identify your computer. Okay, so each one of those bits of information are not terribly unique. For example, uh, you know, say 60% of web of, of intern internauts use Chrome as a web browser. So that doesn't really, you know, it might be like two in three people are using Chrome. That doesn't really make you unique, but it's an extra bit of information. If you have a particular resolution screen, uh, so do probably many other people. But then there are variations on these things. For example, as I said, Chrome on a smartphone, that's a slightly different browser than Chrome on a desktop or a laptop. So all of these little bits of information, some of them might identify you like one in a thousand people. Sometimes it's only like one in three people, right? But if I take all the other bits of information, like default language, time zone, blah, 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 the font test, the WebGL test, the Canvas test, I take all these bits of information and I put them together and that's how I get a unique identifier. It's not any one individual bit of information that makes me unique. It's the combination of all those uh, uh, less unique bits of information that sort of add all together into this big long chain of, of bits. And it's that whole string of bits that make me unique on the internet. So basically what they do is they, they uh, have a little bit of JavaScript code. For example, you're reviewing a web page and uh, advertisers are showing you ads. So, you know, we have all these privacy protections and tracking protection and all this stuff, but all they have to do is run a little bit of sort of JavaScript code that you don't even know is there, and it's drawing boxes on the screen that you can't even see, and it's gathering information that you can get from JavaScript and putting it all together, and you can generate a unique, essentially a unique code that uniquely identifies your computer, and then they can just send that code up to their server. So, Okay, well, why does that matter? Well, because say that, uh, you know, Facebook like buttons or uh, say like, you know, Google Analytics or, you know, some, some JavaScript code that's present on like pretty much all websites, if they actually do browser fingerprinting, then it doesn't matter if you're logged in or not. It doesn't matter if you're using, you know, private browsing mode. Uh, we have, you know, you can tell the browser, send a, you know, a do not track signal. Uh, that doesn't matter. Um, the enhanced tracking protection that's, that's present in, say, Firefox, uh, that doesn't matter. The even private browsing mode doesn't actually matter. And you can actually prove this to yourself. Uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation has a website called panopticlick.eff.org. I'll put the link down in the description. Uh, but this panopticlick thing is basically um, sort of a demonstration of browser fingerprinting. And 
you can go there and you can actually say, okay, fingerprint my browser. And it'll tell you like, oh, you have like 18 bits of entropy that uniquely identifies you like one in 262,000. And so of course you're probably gonna think like, oh, well, one in 262,000, there are seven and a half billion people on the planet, right? I'm perfectly safe. Well, no, not really, because they also sort of say that, yeah, this is a sort of a proof of concept. We didn't actually, you know, give everything away. So it's just sort of a demonstration of what's possible with browser fingerprinting. So about four years ago, what I did is I made my own version. You can go online and you can find people's various, uh, you know, free sort of open source browser fingerprinting techniques. So I gathered all these together and I made my own browser fingerprint code in JavaScript. And my results were that I was actually able to consistently get 33 bits. Now, 33 bits of entropy, what that basically means is that my JavaScript browser fingerprinting code could uniquely identify one in eight and a half billion computers or people. Um, I did not share that code uh, because that would not be a very smart thing to do, but I spent about a day working on it and the whole point was you know, I saw that, you know, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, they're, they've got this panopticlick thing, they're trying to inform people about it, that's good. And I said, okay, well, you know, I wanted to really see for myself, like, so how dangerous is this? And yeah, the answer is that it's, it's pretty bad. I mean, like I said, I only spent about a day and I got it to uniquely identify one in eight and a half billion people, which is more than the number of people on planet Earth right now. Um, so yeah, browser fingerprinting is actually... Uh, definitely a problem in terms of privacy. Back like four years ago when I made this browser fingerprint code, uh, at that time everyone was kind of saying, oh, no, there's nothing to worry about, you know, advertisers used to use browser fingerprinting, but then they, now they say that they're not, so it's all okay, no one's using it. Well, e okay, but then why is, <laughs> why did Mozilla just announce, yeah, we're going to release Firefox 72 on January 7th and it has browser fingerprinting protection. Why would they go through all that work if it wasn't an actual problem still? And of course, generally speaking, we know that, yeah, privacy is not exactly uh, very common online these days with various revelations on various topics and spying and that sort of thing. So uh, you can be pretty darn sure that darn near everyone out there is actually doing browser fingerprinting. And practically what that means is that you can be using this certain browser, uh, and even if you go into private browsing mode, uh, the number of, of bits that uniquely identify you, it doesn't even change. And you can actually verify it for yourself, as I did, on this panopticlick.eff.org website. You can turn on and off enhanced tracking protection, whatever the number of bits that uniquely identify you, they don't change. Okay, so it's obviously a big problem. Uh, now that I've absolutely scared the crap out of everyone, <laughs> Uh, what can you actually do to protect yourself from browser fingerprinting? Well, obviously you could try, for example, Firefox 72 when it comes out in January. Uh, but even Mozilla says, well, it's not really going to be, it, it helps. Um, the Electronic Frontier Foundation on their Panopticlick website, they even recommend, they say, well, um, use the Tor web browser. Uh, well, I've talked about Tor before, and Tor was actually kind of created by uh, sort of the... Uh, uh, questionable groups who like to spy on people and that sort of thing and popularized by them so uh, be that as it may the Tor browser is still you know okay so it's still pretty good at least maybe for certain elements of, of privacy but uh, they even note that well yeah but even if you use the Tor browser you still have to pretty much turn off JavaScript because as I said at the beginning of the video the way that you gather all these bits of information is via JavaScript now you can go in your web browser, in any web browser, and basically turn JavaScript off, but if you do that, you're breaking essentially 95% of the internet because every website uses JavaScript. Uh, you can use a plugin like NoScript, except then you have to manually say, yes, re-enable this, re-enable that for all the websites you visit, and very often you will find that suddenly websites become horribly broken if you turn off JavaScript. And I used NoScript for a while, and it was a huge pain because JavaScript is so common now that it was just more trouble than it was worth. One thing you can do is try not to be so unique. Now, like for example, uh, don't, you know, if everyone is using Chrome, don't decide to use like the Vivaldi web browser or don't decide to use Opera. Use a browser that many other people are using because right there, if you're using some 
particularly unique web browser that instantly makes your browser fingerprint like super unique. Uh, if you're, whatever web browser you're using, don't install like crazy plugins that not everyone might have. For example, you know, back in the olden days, Garmin had a, uh, it's like a, a GPS update plugin for your browser and you could do online updates and everything. Not everyone is going to have that. In fact, far fewer people are going to have it. They're going to be in the minority, which means that that plugin will be able to be used to uniquely identify you and make your browser fingerprint more unique. Okay, well, that's kind of hard to do because you have to know what everyone else is using and blah, blah, blah. Um, it's not really a solution. So really the solution is, um, for example, videos like this and what Mozilla is doing releasing browser fingerprint protection and what the Electronic Frontier Fund Foundation did with Panopticlick. It's to simply share this information and get people aware of it, make people aware that, yes, browser fingerprinting is real. Uh, it can uniquely identify you. Uh, you can be on one browser and then go into private browsing mode and yeah, okay, maybe your cookies aren't there so you're not logged in in private browsing mode, but if you have ads in both those windows that are generating a unique ID, uh, the unique ID will match, which means all of the, the, the stuff that exists today in terms of, of privacy protection, it's pretty much all killed completely by browser fingerprinting. So what we need is for more people to be aware of this because as we're having you know, congressional hearings where Google and Facebook and all these people are being grilled, you know, these big companies and big data and everyone is kind of up in arms about privacy and people are saying like, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, boycott Google and all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, we're all kind of fired up about, about privacy and this is one of the topics that we need to be aware of and we need to share the information with everyone so that when we're having these hearings and stuff, we're kind of going like, oh yeah, so that's great. You're not doing this anymore. You're not, you're not spying on people like that, but hang on a minute. What about browser fingerprints? And when they say, no, no, we don't do that. Um, yeah, they probably do because it's really easy to do. And they were doing it before. Then they claim they're not. And yet here we have Mozilla coming out with fingerprint protection because obviously they're still around. Yeah, that's about it. Uh, for more techie tips, see scottystech.info. Thanks for watching. See you next time.